Fulcher Croeso, welcome. As chair of the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales, the lead partner in the Cherish project, I am very pleased indeed to welcome you all to Dublin Castle for the Cherish End of Project Conference entitled Ambition, Delivery and Legacy. The cut, this is the culmination of six years of European funded uh, research, um, an Ireland Wales project investigating climate change and coastal heritage. Firstly, you will hear from members of the Cherish team about the ambition of the project, how that was delivered and the legacy that the project will leave behind. You will also hear from external speakers who have been involved in the project and how they have worked with the team. It is a testament to the strength of the project and the strong links between Ireland and Wales to have delivered it in the midst of um, both the accelerating climate crisis and despite the testing times caused by the COVID pandemic. Um, I now want to introduce uh, videos from the two ministers. Firstly, um, I would like to introduce um, the video from Malcolm Noonan, the Minister of State at the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, with special responsibility for heritage and electoral reform. This will be followed by the video from the Minister from the Welsh Government, Julie James, who is the Minister for Climate Change. Good morning, everyone. It's a real honour for me to join with you on marking this important milestone in the life of the Cherish Project. And I'm so sorry that I've not been able to join you in person. Cherish is a genius project acronym. The climate, heritage and environments of reefs, islands and headlands. Finding a title that captures interest and imagination and which expresses the ambition of a project is not always easy, but you've nailed it. We care about the world around us and the changes that are happening to it. Informed decision making and informed responses to these changes requires sound evidence and reliable data. It also requires a recognition of how climate change challenges often seen in isolation from or even in competition with each other, have in fact shared aspects and require collaborative and cooperative attention. Since 2017, when the Cherish commenced, it has brought together four principal partners across Ireland and Wales. The Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales, the Department of Geography and Earth Sciences at Arboriswith University, Geological Survey of Ireland, and the Discovery Programmes Centre for Archaeology and Innovation Ireland. This international, interdisciplinary and interinstitutional project has sought to explore the past as a means of understanding how our climate has changed and over time and how climate change is impacting our coastal heritage. The research results stemming from the project are being made available to help build resilience and increase capacity and knowledge of climate change adaptation for the Irish Sea and coastal communities. The project has seen significant investment across Ireland and Wales, amounting to some 6.1 million euro, of which 4.9 million euro has been provided through the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. I am pleased that the project has been supported through the Heritage Council of Ireland, facilitated by the funding it receives from my department. Indeed, there has been a close working relationship between my officials in the National Monument Service and the project at all stages. The project team has gathered much scientific data about climate change impacts and it is clear that there is change happening on a continuous basis and all around our coastline. An important part of the Cherish project has been to start quantifying, mapping and reporting on these changes which will inform long-term strategies to understand and respond to the impacts of climate change happening now and into the future. By building this evidence base about the impacts and how and where they happen, the project is informing what we may do about those impacts and how we adapt and mitigate changes that affect the places that we care about and value. 
The project has taken an innovative and multidisciplinary approach using new technology and techniques to map, survey, record and investigate sites. There are many research highlights resulting from this work, including the survey and documentation of some of the most dramatically cited historical monuments located in the diverse coastal environments of Ireland and Wales, such as the promontory forts, abbeys, ring forts and settlement sites, as well as historic shipwrecks on the foreshore and seabed. Over the course of the project, we have witnessed various extreme weather events, including storms and droughts. The project team has seen and will share in the conference today the changes that have been observed in real time. In County Kerry, the ongoing erosion of the iconic promontory fort of Dunbeg is perhaps one of the starkest examples of the power of the ocean and the impact of coastal change on our archaeological heritage in a very short period of time. I am pleased to note that the legacy of the Cherish project is already supporting my department's progress on our climate change sectoral adaptation plan for built and archaeological heritage. I look forward to the use of the resources developed by the Cherish project and especially the Cherish toolkit with its associated guidance. The project has taken a practical approach to identifying, understanding and sharing new knowledge. Importantly, it has engaged with and included local communities in a meaningful way with the study areas. Through the publication of highly illustrated newsletters, field schools, open days and workshops, practitioners and communities have collaborated and learned from each other. I want to congratulate all involved in this project. It is clear that the project caught the imagination of many. In Ireland, I know that the Cherish team was very grateful for the supports given to it by my department's National Monument Service, the Heritage Council, the Office of Public Works and local authority heritage officers. And centrally, the partnership that has been built with our wonderful Geological Survey of Ireland will, I am sure, be one of the true legacies of Cherish. I thank my colleagues in the Welsh Government, our partners of the Royal Commission and the Ancient Historical Monuments of Wales, and Aberystwyth University's Department of Geography and Earth Sciences for their unstinting commitment. Cherish truly is an exemplar of Ireland-Wales cooperation, and I very much hope that this spirit of partnership continues into the future. I know that today's conference will be engaging and inspiring. Through the work of Cherish and all those who have been part of this great cooperative project, key policies are being shaped and strategies developed to address in a real way the impact of climate change. You all have so much to be proud of and I wish you fair wins in the years ahead as we continue to work together with the urgency required. So may all continue to cherish that which we hold so dear. Good morning everyone. I'm really delighted to be able to speak to you today alongside Minister Noonan as we celebrate the achievements and success of Cherish and I'm only really sorry that I can't be with you there in person. Today you will hear in more detail what the project has achieved in their aim of raising awareness and understanding of the past, present and near future impacts of climate change on the rich cultural heritage of our sea and coasts. Over the last six years, the highly skilled team at Cherish have integrated a range of cutting edge skills and tools to help us plan for and manage the impacts of climate change. This includes an extensive programme of field investigations, which has revealed new insights into our rich archaeological record and improved our understanding of long term patterns of environmental change. Both Wales and Ireland have set challenging net zero targets and our historic environment provides a tangible record of our shared past from which we can learn valuable lessons going forward. Cherish's work at heritage sites and landscapes along our coast and on the seabed has increased our knowledge and understanding of the threats from changing weather and climate and how to mitigate against them. And I was delighted to launch the Cherish exhibition at the Senes last year, focused on how climate change is affecting our cultural heritage, as well as showcasing the many sites and landscapes where the project has been working. Linking land and sea, employing a variety of techniques and methods to study some of the most iconic coastal locations in Ireland and Wales, the project also highlights the importance of partnership, working across our sea border and across sectors. Tackling the climate emergency is at the heart of the Welsh Government's priorities. 
However, we have a fundamental belief that we can approach these challenges better through collaboration rather than unilateral action. Cherish is one of 24 projects within the 100 um, Euro million Ireland Wales Cooperation Programme 2014 to 2020, a programme which has a long standing record of success in delivering solutions to common challenges across our shared waters. By tackling these shared interests and priorities, projects such as Cherish are driving innovative action on climate change, whilst also producing wider benefits to communities on both sides of the Irish Sea. This includes using the principles of knowledge sharing and transfer of best practice, integral throughout the Ireland Wales programme, to develop joint Welsh-Irish standards for the monitoring of coastal heritage impacts of climate change. As we look to the future, our ambition is to continue a cross-border strategic approach with our Irish counterparts as part of the Irish Sea framework, linked to our ambitions within the Ireland-Wales Shared Statement and Joint Action Plan. The framework is our commitment to explore options to collaborate and work in partnership to ensure that we grow and prosper with the wealth of opportunities that the Wales-Ireland relationship has to offer. As part of that approach, on St Patrick's Day, we launched an Agile Cymru Irish Sea funding initiative directly supporting the framework to stimulate economic cooperation across and around the Irish Sea space. We're also planning a second virtual Irish Sea Symposium on the 23rd of May, which will be opened by our Minister for Economy to build on our existing engagement and cooperation on this agenda. Cherish is an excellent example of a collaborative project tackling issues such as climate change, which is integral to our ambitions moving forward. And finally, I would just like to thank our four partners, the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales, the Discovery Programme, Centre for Archaeology and Innovation Ireland, Aberystwyth University and Geological Survey Ireland for their outstanding success. Our heritage in Wales and Ireland is a precious, irreplaceable resource, and the work Cherish has undertaken will help inform the debate on how our historic environment can be better managed and sustained for the benefit of present and our future generations. Thank you very much indeed. I really hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Dioch. Um, I'm now very pleased to introduce Claire Lancaster, the project manager for Cherish, who is based in the Royal Commission. Goramaga, uh, Diochavar Yang, thank you. Uh, good morning, Varda. It is my pleasure to be here today to introduce to you the project and the day itself. Uh, first of all, I would like you ta to take you back to eight years BC, before Cherish, when a group of archaeologists, geographers and geologists got together to share views and concerns about the effect that climate change is having on the coast and its heritage. Those meetings initiated the idea for an ambitious European-funded project to raise awareness and understanding of the past, present, and near future impacts of climate change, storminess, and extreme weather on the rich cultural heritage of our sea and coast. So Cherish, Climate Heritage and Environment of Reefs, Islands, and Headlands was born in 2015 and was approved for funding through the European-funded Ireland Wales programme. Funding was through access to of the Interreg programme the overall objective being to increase the capacity and knowledge of climate change adaptation to Irish Sea coastal communities. Following those initial meetings in Dublin in 2015, the project partners of the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales, Aberystwyth University, the Discovery Programme and Geological Survey of Ireland developed the project with four main aims. Reconstructing past environments and weather history, discovering, assessing, mapping, and monitoring heritage on land and beneath the sea, targeting data and knowledge gaps to raise awareness of heritage in remote coastal locations, and establishing new metrically accurate baseline data and recording standards. The project began in 2017, following approval of just over 4 million euros of funding, and subsequently had a further phase added, allowing the project to receive further millions and take us to June 2023. As well as the four main aims, there are also 11 Cherish initiatives developed to raise awareness with coastal communities, and today will allow us to share with you some of the work that has been done to deliver those initiatives. Phase one identified nine initiatives, 
an integrated joint nation team using the latest innovative technologies and remote sensing techniques to develop joint good practice guidance to provide a permanent network of the first 3D baseline fixed survey points for data for selected heritage assets for future monitoring of climate change to provide an enhanced and updated National Historic Environment data set, helping to inform priority lists for statutory designation. To provide an enhanced paleoenvironmental data inventory from selected locations to reconstruct past environments and inform future adaptation strategies. To provide a number of innovative digital real maps derived from LIDAR and photogrammetry, which will provide 3D geomatic data for planning and management to provide engaging workshops, seminars and outreach events, to raise awareness and train the citizen scientists in survey and recording, heritage at risk, climate change and storminess impacts, to run community excavations, to train citizen scientists in local communities to record heritage sites at risk, to provide an open access shared website for information delivery and awareness raising, to provide detailed landowner management plans showing cultural heritage assets and climate change threats, and under phase two, we identified a further two initiatives to integrate the Cherish project with the tourism sector or the blue economy and to integrate with the education sector in Wales and Ireland. So as the project was developed, sites within the funding area of Ireland and Wales were identified as priority areas. And the map here, illustrated by Caris Tate, shows the areas that the team identified. The project was never intended as an all coast project we focused on a range of environments and heritage sites, maritime, intertidal, islands and coast edge, promontory forts, shipwrecks, peat deposits, coastal lakes and dune systems. These sites and areas were selected following consultation and assessment of previous work. Work began earnestly in 2017 on both sides of the Irish Sea, and we have witnessed and recorded erosion, exposure and change to our heritage along our dynamic coast. In 2018, Four major storms hit events hit Wales and Ireland, including the beasts from the east. And in June that year, we witnessed a heat wave and drought event. Over that year, Cherish discovered exposed peat layers containing a series of animal footprints dating to the Bronze Age on a beach near Abersoch. And during a return monitoring visit to the Sunbeam shipwreck situated on a beach in County Kerry, we were shocked to see that the 200-year-old wreck disappeared and we were greatly saddened when we subsequently located it damaged and exposed over two kilometres away. During that year, winter storms and increased rainfall saw dramatic collapses at two important monuments, Dunbeg Coastal Promontory Fort in County Kerry and Dinas Dintley Coastal Hill Fort in Gwynedd. Such collapses take with them valuable archaeology and information about these special places. Put simply, we can't save these sites. We have to accept their loss. But what is vital is that we learn as much as possible about them before they're permanently lost to the waves. It's also important that our work here is planned rather than reactive. And a planned response is exactly what Cherish is about. And then with an investment of the European funded Island Wales programme, we've achieved a considerable amount since 2017. And as we come towards the end of the project in a few months time, I would like to highlight just three examples of what this investment has enabled. Over 50 monuments have been surveyed to centimetre accuracy on the coast edge, in the intertidal zone and on the seabed, not only providing accurate baseline data for future erosion monitoring, but increasing our understanding of monuments at risk, which in turn helps with their management, but also provides new data and 3D models to engage all generations with. We have obtained detailed sedimentary records from multiple sites around the Welsh and Irish coasts. Analysis of the 120 metres of sediment core has provided new insights into the history of climate change, storm and activity and sea level change over millennia. Our evidence demonstrates the dynamic and ever-changing shape of our coastline. It has always changed and we need to acknowledge this as we adapt to the significant challenges we face now. We've engaged with over 14,000 people. This has include, included three investments in community excavations in Wales and Ireland, attracting over 120 volunteers as well as beach cleans, guided walks, day schools and training events, all raising awareness of the impacts of climate change on our heritage to coastal communities. But it's also enabled us to talk with and learn from those living in the coastal zone. Those who are experienced at first hand what's happening. A number have become our eyes on the ground, reporting to us any changes they observe. 
One of the greatest successes of Cherish, Cherish has to be the collaboration between the four partners and the two nations. We work together, sharing, combining our skills and expertise to operate as a single survey team. We've learned so much from each other and hope to build on these relationships in the future. We know that climate change is happening and that there's an increasing sense of urgency to the discussion which must take place about the best way forward, how we adapt to it. We hope that the work of Cherish can help here. And today we will be launching a resource that shares our practice of investigating heritage and climate change in coastal and maritime environments. This looks at our toolkit, the technology and methods we employed, our evidence on long-term landscape and climate change, recent losses and new archaeological discoveries provide the basis for both local site management and broader policy decisions and for discussions for communities who are facing loss and change. So today we will introduce you to some of the work that the project has over undertaken over the six years. You will hear from members of the Cherish team and organisations that have been involved with the project. But a day isn't long enough to tell you all about the work that Cherish has undertaken, but we leave a robust legacy. The website will remain after the project is finished, where there are newsletters, reports and information about all of the work that the project has undertaken. While scientific and survey data is being permanently archived with several national agencies. So onto the program, the conference program itself. We are delighted that we have two rooms of trade stands. So as well as in the main foyer, in the poddle room, which is just off the foyer, you will find some of the other Ireland Wales projects who have displayed to show the work they have been undertaking through European funded. So please make sure to visit all of the areas of the conference event space. And you will see a couple of Cherish pop-ups right by the door to point the way through. And please ask a member of the Cherish team if you're unsure. But a quick run through of the program program for the rest of the day. The first session will be themed around understanding loss and how the Cherish team have used various survey methods to record and monitor the changes to the coastal heritage around Ireland and Wales. Following a coffee break and a chance to view the trade stands, the second session will address living with change and what the project has learned from the investigations. And in that session, we will have two case studies Ferritus Promontory Fort in Ireland, which is presented by Sandra Henry, who has previously worked on the Cherish project, and the Bronze Bell Shipwreck in Wales, presented by Alison James from MSDS Marine, who carried out the dive on behalf of the project. Each of the sessions will have a discussion panel, and you will have noticed that we are using Slido, so you'll be able to submit questions during the talks using that, or via a roving mic at the end of all the talks in each of the session. There are QR codes on the programs on your table for you to access the site if you haven't done already. A lunch break will allow you to do an opportunity to network and view the Travel and Cherish exhibition, which again is in the Poddle Room, and which we've brought with us today, and which is available to come to any location in Ireland and Wales, should you want us to. Uh, following lunch, session three will look at how the project has raised awareness of climate change and coastal heritage, and will include presentations from organisations that the project has worked with. Robbie Galvin will talk about how the project has worked with the Copper Coast Geopark, and Cathy Laws will introduce and showcase the, case the work undertaken at the national site in Dinas Dinclay, North Wales. And finally, Julian Ruddock and Pete Monaghan will discuss how Cherish has influenced their artwork. And we're also delighted that the results of this long-running artistic collaboration are also being showcased at the conference, reflecting a different way to communicate the climate emergency. Further networking and a well-earned coffee break will lead us to the final session of the day when we will look towards the world post-Cherish. We will officially launch the Cherish Best Practice Guide and discuss the legacy that the project leaves behind. And the final visioning discussion will see experts in climate heritage discuss where they would like to see climate change in five years' time and how do we get there. Following closing remarks, there will be a drinks reception and a chance to view the exhibition of artwork created by Julian and Pete and a chance to speak to the members of the Cherish team. So don't forget that you can submit questions for papers via Slido uh, and we will also be running polls and having a competition at the start of each session with a chance to win some Cherish prizes. Mm, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we hope that you will enjoy the conference. Um, and hearing about the work of Cherish. And I would now like to ask the speakers for session one to take to the stage, uh, chaired by Pauline Gleeson from the National Monument Service and who is also a member of the Cherish Advisory Committee. Many thanks, Jochen Bau.
I'm gonna take my glasses. Sorry, I forgot my glasses. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Claire. That was a fantastic overview. And um, uh, my name is Pauline Gleeson. <clears throat> I'm a senior archaeologist in the National Monuments Service. And together with Carl Brady, who many of you know, um, we uh, represent the National Monuments Service on the uh, Advisory Committee for Cherish and have done so for the last number of years. So we're delighted to be here today to acknowledge the work of Cherish, uh, such an inspirational project and uh, with a lasting impact, particularly in relation to the implementation of our climate change sectoral adaptation plan. And we thank you for that. We acknowledge your work. Um, so this session is Understanding Loss. Um, I have a few um, items to go through first before introducing the speakers. Um, just to remind everybody, <coughs> excuse me, there are feedback forms on the tables and um, Cherish would like to encourage you to, to fill them in. Also, I'm introducing the Slido quiz that Claire spoke about. And um, it's a very short quiz, I'm assured. And it's the fastest answer um, will win the Cherish prizes. And I think we press go now on that Slido quiz. Is that correct, Claire? Yes. So the Slido quiz is live. And as Claire said, the, um, you can submit questions for our speakers um, on Slido, and of course on the roving mics that will be in the auditorium as well. And Leslie is our Slido monitor. Thank you very much, Leslie. So, to understanding loss and understanding cultural heritage, baseline assessment, ongoing monitor, monitoring from which to measure change are key aspects of the Cherish programme. And this is what our session this morning is about. So, I, I won't delay in introducing our first speaker, Anthony Corns of Cherish Programme and Discovery Programme, deploying the Cherish Toolkit. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us here today and highlight the achievements from the Cherish Project. My name is Anthony Corns. I'm the Technology Manager at the Discovery Programme. I'm one of the four partners within the Cherish Project. And over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to introduce the Cherish Toolkit and outline the 15 complementary methods we employed over the past six years, which have improved our understanding of the effects of climate change on our coastal and marine historic environment. Each of the tools outlined here will be covered in more detail in presentations by other members of the Cherish team. And Louise Bark will officially launch the uh, publication later this afternoon. So the Cherish Toolkit, one of the greatest strengths of the project is the interdisciplinary approach we've taken in the integration of effects, or looking at the effects of climate change on our coastal and marine heritage. The Cherish Toolkit is a series of technologies, expertise and complementary methods employed by each of the project partners which have enabled us to understand the effects of climate change on our cultural heritage at the coast and in the marine. We've been working in many different environments including the skies, on the coastal edge, on the, on the waves and underwater, and finally in the more calmer and dry confines of the laboratory and archives. Our first toolkit approach is airborne laser scanning, also known as LIDAR. Here, a laser scanner on board an aerial platform, usually a fixed wing aircraft, travels across the landscape recording tens of thousands of points a second, which result in an accurate 3D model of the landscape surface, which can be visualized to identify geomorphological and archaeological landscape features and highlight areas of erosion and loss at the coast. Within the project, several areas were recorded using this approach, including the same example of Bardsey Island in Wales. And LIDAR is great for covering large areas such as regional and national survey programs. However, for more cost-effective and responsive ways of recording smaller areas or individual sites is to use UAVs or drones. Over the course of the project, several drones are being deployed and utilized on many sites, enabling us to observe and capture spectacular imagery and video of eroding sites, including this site here of Glass Carrig in County Wexford. But more importantly, through the process of structure for motion photogrammetry, we've been able to digitally document in 3D a range of monuments, producing relief shaded and ortho image outputs 
Here, the Morton Bailey site at Glass Carrig uh, on Wexford soft sedimentary coast was recorded in both 2018 and 2021 using the UAV. And analysing the difference between these three, two 3D data sets, 3D landscape models have enabled us to identify areas of active erosion and accretion, indicated uh, the red areas on this, on this image here indicate areas of high erosion. Another aerial or space-based approach is the use of satellite imagery. Free to access imagery such as the EU Copernicus programme has enabled the project to create bathymetric models for areas such as Dublin Bay. Satellite imagery has the additional benefit that the data is collected on a highly regular basis here in the instance every five days so the changes in the coastal environment can be identified rapidly. And our final aerial approach is the archaeological aerial reconnaissance, which involves observing and recording the landscape below from a uh, light aircraft, such as a Cessna. From this perspective, we are able to identify and photograph many of our archaeological and built heritage sites in their archaeological and landscape context, such as this dramatic image uh, Toby took of Skellig Michael last year. And importantly, aerial reconnaissance can be employed during advantageous times, such as drought conditions, which enable the prospection of crop marks, revealing hidden archaeology beneath the surface. Here, a potential enclosure is visible at Marlowe's Pembrokeshire in Wales. With our feet more firmly on the ground, uh, the first of our terrestrial-based methods is geophysical survey. Through the use of a range of devices such as magnetometers, electrical resistivity, ground-penetrating radar, we're able to identify hidden archaeological features which potentially could be lost, especially through coastal erosion. At the Dinnerstinley Hill Fort in Gwynedd, several geophysical methods were utilised across the site, enabling the identification of buried archaeological structures and features, which were later exposed through the process of excavation. In paleoenvironmental reconstruction, we, we, to understand how climate change has affected our heritage, we can look back through time using these methods. Through the process of coring sedimentary sequences, long-term evolution of our coastal sites has been better understood. Through the analysis of cores, we are able to identify changes in human agricultural activity, vegetation, landscape change, and also the specific areas of historic and ancient storminess. A more traditional approach used in archaeology is terrestrial, terrestrial metric survey, uh, and is one of the most uh, common uses within most uh, survey sections. It uses non-invasive survey techniques, still actively used by professionals today, but advancements in technology with GNSS have enabled data to be collected much faster, more accurately, and more, preci more precisely. Within the Cherish project, we've used these methods to, in to produce interpretation plans of archaeological sites, such as this site in, in Limey Head, Promontory Fort in Pembrokeshire. And to assist the accurate monitoring of sites going forwards, a series of permanent uh, survey markers have been established around heritage sites, both in Ireland and Wales. And for those sites where upstanding remains are still visible, such as tower houses, castles and other historical structures, detailed documentation using 3D terrestrial laser scanners has enabled the Cherish project to record these buildings to high specification and precision. Periodic survey has enabled the team to monitor st uh, structural decay on many sites, including this, this friary at Clon Mines, County Wexford. And we've highlighted areas where erosion and stone degradation has taken place and conservation probably needs to take place in the, in the near future. And for those sites which are sitting precariously close to the eroding edge, traditional excavation is the only real way to uh, record and uh, uh, expose some of the sites before they're lost. Within the Cherish project, excavations at Carvai and Ferritus Promontory Fort in Kerry produce new insights at Life on the Edge. And where sites are actively uh, eroding and significant portions of the monuments have already been lost, cliff face recording of exposed sections has provided an invaluable way to understand the, phas the phasing and structural components of many archaeological sites, such as these on, the, on uh, Waterford's Copper Coast. And for those areas where coastlines where systematic recording and analysis was required, Cherish, the Cherish project employed the established method of coastline zone assessment. Through collaboratory fieldwork between archaeologists, geologists, geomorphologists and additional other skills, sites and erosion status have, um, have uh, 
North County Dublin's coastline was established and new sites identified. Within the maritime environment, the Cherish project was able to use, utilize the expertise and infrastructure of the Geological Survey of Ireland's mapping fleet to record inshore waters. Improved bathymetric surveys uh, surrounding our coastline, such as Puffin Island here in Wales, and on historic shipwrecks, such as this example of the Manchester Merchant in Kerry, has enabled the development of improved management plans and analysis of wreck, de wreck deterioration. And where more detailed inspection of historic wrecks was required, traditional archaeological diving was utilised, and the use of robotic uh, operated vehicles or ROVs was used within the project also. Un using underwater photography and photogrammetry enabled the project to, to provide detailed survey of the underwater remains and how they've changed over the past years. Even though the project has many different examples of technology and survey capabilities at our disposal, the ability to carry out depth-based analysis on many of our study sites has also proved very invaluable. <coughs> analysis across a range of historical documents, including plans, sketches, photographs, antiquarian drawings and descriptions, has enabled the Cherish project to document and understand the loss of several sites, including here at Doonbeg Promontory Fort on the Dingle Peninsula in Kerry. For scientific data and a key component to many of the archaeological and paleoenvironmental investigations within the Cherish projects require the ability to date sequences and archaeological structures. And using C14 lead isotope and uh, thermo thermoluminescence dates and techniques there has, been, has been crucial for the development of the archaeological chronologies and better understanding of our past environments and human activity. And finally, through the use of apps and citizen science, Cherish has enabled local communities to record the dynamic coastline and archaeological sites, allowing people to contribute to the management and monitoring of their own historic coastal environment. So thanks for this opportunity to present the Cherish toolkit in its entirety. And as stated earlier, many of the methods outlined here will be explored more detail, in more detail with the, the speakers who follow this. And please uh, take time to go into the Cherish exhibition, which is, in, as Claire mentioned, at the end of the main room there. And, uh, the, a lot of the sites we worked on and a lot of the techniques we used are kind of explored in more detail on this exhibition also. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Anthony, and for, I suppose, introducing the very different approach used by Church. Um, and we're going to look in more detail. Oh, sorry, I'm now live. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Anthony, for uh, deploying the various approaches used um, in, by Cherish uh, into this fantastic document, which is going to be, um, have a really uh, long use, certainly in terms of our own work and particularly in relation to climate change sector adaptation plan, but, um, but also for, for ourselves and others. You know, so it's, 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 very, very, um, it's, it's very well written, very, very well illustrated. It's a fantastic document. Um, so it, going through the uh, individual items in more detail now, I'm going to introduce Kieran Craven um, from Cherish, TechWorks Marine on behalf of the Geological Survey of Ireland, and who will talk about maritime surveys seeing beneath the waves. Thanks, Kieran. Excellent. Thanks, Pauline. And thanks, for everyone, for joining us today. So Ireland and Wales are two coastal nations with a very large marine influence. And our positions on the east coast of the Atlantic in the mid latitudes means that the marine element has a large control on our, our weather systems and our climate. A lot of storms coming in from the Atlantic and we're never too far away from a good storm over here. The image on the left hand side was taken during the Cherish project itself. It was Hurricane Lorenzo at the time which is the most easterly and northerly um, category 5 hurricane that was experienced in our area, which was downgraded to a storm when it hit our, our coasts. But as you'll see through the course of this day, there's been a number of storms which we have experienced here over just the short duration of five years of this project. And from the marine element, what we are, are interested in trying to, to look at and, and in Cherish is what is happening offshore, which has an influence on the, the waves on the tides that are particularly associated with these high magnitude storm events. Those 
combined with the impacts of sea level rise can lead to increased flooding and the, therefore the, the changes that happen to our coast which impact our heritage, so increased coastal erosion and also perhaps degradation of our underwater heritage. Over the course of the project, we looked at a, a number of sites around both Ireland and Wales and being able to use both the um, experience and the infrastructure of the Infomar program based out of the, the Geological Survey Ireland and the Marine Institute, we were able to, to combine the, the marine surveys with the other elements that Anthony has touched on uh, that you'll see through the rest of the day, particularly the, the diving and the UAV surveys uh, to greater understand our coastal areas in both jurisdictions. And over the five years, we got to a, a number of different places, um, stretching right the way around the Irish coastline in the, the different areas that Cherish had been, been focusing on. And almost every year, we got over to Wales, and we were able to focus on some key areas identified by our partners over there. And these helped us to understand a, a regional picture, maybe a, a couple of kilometres either side of important coastal sites. They allowed us to focus in on shipwrecks, and they also allowed us to provide new information for uh, environmental variables that we were able to, to get to understand perhaps the, the wave regimes in some of these key sites and the, the impact that that could have to our, our coastal heritage. And the kind of data that, that we got, these are examples from, from Wales, are um, seabed bathymetry, so using acoustic techniques to um, sonify the seabed and get a return of, of the, the depth. And this has given us some uh, quite fantastic images and a greater understanding of some really important areas. This is Sarn Badrick, just off the, the coast of, of Wales, a very shallow ridge that because of the, the difficulty and the shallowness of the area have been quite difficult to map, but being able to target through the Cherish project, we were able to reveal what looks like an incredibly nice esker, a, a, a sub-ice feature that runs that, that ridge that was very different from the, the mapped charts. And again, a number of shipwrecks on this area and now a greater understanding of that regional uh, aspect. Also collected from the vessels was the, the backscatter. This is the, the strength of the signal that comes back from the, the sound source. And this can give you information on the type of sediments that you might have a, a very um, strong return from something like a rock or a gravel. But in your muds, you would tend to have the sound is more dissipated and you have a low backscatter. And here, the black areas are, are more muddy, sandy areas and the grey area is more hard material. So the first insight to maybe start looking at the type of sediment that we have in some of these, these areas. We went around Puffin and we were able to take some um, seabed samples from here and from a, a number of other um, places, the Puffin Islands. We looked in detail at some of the, the shipwrecks in both Ireland and in Wales uh, and got some really nice images and some um, high density data from some key signature sites. In the last year we went over to, to Wales, this would be uh, 2020, uh, I believe we went to a number of areas where we'd visited before and this was great with the collaboration over the number of years that we were able to, to uh, visit sort of sites repeatedly, collect seabed samples, which then allowed us combined with the backscatter to build up some sediment pictures of a number of these areas so with rocks and sand and, uh, and coarse material. You have some mixed area, muddy areas around, um, around Puffin Island. So again, building up our offshore understanding of these areas, which can then help inform what is maybe happening in shallow waters and, and inshore. We also combined it with, with other techniques and the Cherish project allowed us to trial these. Uh, this is using the, the satellite images from the, the European Space Agency um, and using the sort of like dissipation of light through the water column to understand the or to, to give an indication of water depth. And again, being able to, to build on what the Infomar program had been doing in, in areas where they've been using their boats in these areas to be able to, to correlate and be able to, to cross-reference uh, depths collected by boats 
with the depths that we have from the satellite images. And we're able to see that certainly over about six meter water depths that we were able to get some information from this because the, the shallow coastal zone is a very difficult uh, environment to, to measure due to the, the wave action and the, the shallowness of it getting vessels in there. So being able to investigate novel techniques to try and understand these areas. We then looked at integrating the different technologies and it's one of the key strengths of the Cherish project is being able to, to build on either the experiences and the expertise of the different organizations but also the different techniques that they have and, and this is Dorky Island over um, just in, in Dublin Bay where we were able to get some uh, LIDAR data of the, the emerged island and to merge that with the bathymetry collected from the Cherish project to give us our seamless onshore offshore map which can be used to understand waves in the area, current direction, and other hydrodynamic processes that could then be impacting the onshore uh, heritage. We were able to repeat that over in Wales, Puffin Islands, this is a 3D map uh, of, of the island. And again, uh, Dinis Dintley in Wales, one of the key signature sites. Shipwrecks were another big area to understand the um, the submerged heritage and again some, some high resolution Im images of a number of shipwrecks from both Ireland and Wales and, and while we were sur surveying St. Patrick we were also able to pick up a couple of uncharted wrecks because we were able to have that, that complete coverage. And I think one of the, the key elements certainly for, for me uh, and that Cherish allowed us to do was to go to the same area and, and get those repeat surveys. That it wasn't just a chance of going once and seeing what was there, the, the snapshot, but seeing that change over time that can then start allowing us to understand the processes that are impacting these, these sites. And when we then combine our, our knowledge of you know, what these sites look like with perhaps some environmental parameters, this is wind coming from all directions, these are the waves that we then see are, are predominantly coming from, from the south in this exposed area, the city of London on the, the southeast coast of, of Ireland. We can then do our analyses of, of difference and, and just off the screen here are, are our DSMs of difference of the successive years where blue is where we see sediment accretion, red is where we see sediment er erosion. And one of the key take home messages of, of this one is the dynamic nature of this site. That if we look from successive years in 2020, sorry, from 2018 to 2020, there's sediment accumulation. In the following two years, we see massive erosion. So the medium term look, and we actually even have a, another survey on, on it, the medium to long term look is one of erosion. But the actual picture from a year to year one of, is of a highly dynamic environment. And this is where perhaps we can start to focus our, our understandings to see. And being able to, to go back to these areas to see how dynamic they are, how much they're changing, and the impacts that therefore has on our, our heritage. So leaving that then, we have a lot of freely accessible new data. We have the openings into our understandings of how dynamic um, these places are. And we're then leaving this to help raise awareness for coastal communities. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kieran. <clears throat> I can really see the level of detail um, in one individual approach, <clears throat> and it's really fantastic. Um, just, I have a, a few moments to remind everyone about the, um, the uh, Slido that you can um, submit questions to the speakers, and also to, to, to let you know that if you need more information about our speakers, um, the information is within your um, conference um, information. Um, <clears throat> our third speaker, so going from uh, beneath the waves to the air, is uh, Toby Driver from Cherish and the Royal Commission of Ancient and Historic Monuments Wales, uh, aerial survey documenting joint nation coastal heritage from above. Thanks, Toby. Thank you, Pauline. Orda Pal, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here from the Royal Commission in Wales. Uh, to talk about the discipline of aerial survey uh, within the uh, Cherish Toolkit approach. As Anthony's already said, aerial survey can encompass uh, anything from airborne laser scanning, usually supplied uh, by contractors, 
uh, through to aerial survey in a light aircraft, a helicopter, and then down to uh, fixed wing or, or quadcopter style uh, drone surveys as well. It's all been deployed within the Cherish project. I'm going to be focusing pretty much today on aerial survey from a light aircraft. Here we are seeing Balance Skellix Abbey last May. So the rapid reconnaissance and recording of archaeological sites, uh, anything from 30 to 50 sites an hour from about 1,500 feet in a light aircraft with a nice 200 or 300 mil lens and focusing and getting shots like this with sub-meter resolution, capturing a moment in time of a site useful for a legal record and condition check as well. And also here with, with Balance Gellig's seeing through the offshore waters as well to a certain degree. So there's a question with the ubiquity of drones now, why we still take to the air and hire an aircraft from an airport. So here's a little diagram showing what uh, the flying offers alongside the drones. And both are complementary. Both One can't exist without the other, really. In an aircraft, we have anything for three to five hours endurance in the air, uh, suitable for regional or country survey. We have to fly within visual flight rules, so we can't fly through fog banks or clouds, uh, but we can travel to up to 130 miles an hour. Uh, so it's great if, you know, west coast of Wales, Pembrokeshire, all the way up to Thleen and Anglesey, or Dublin down to Wexford uh, in two and a half, three hours. It's excellent for rapid deployment of, uh, of a camera and an archaeologist. As opposed to that, with the drone, it's ideal for local uh, or small site survey. Um, and, you know, you have about 25 minutes flying time there. More complicated, you have to have land over permission, insurance and so on in place. And usually have a visual line of sight of about 500 metres. They obviously have different parameters for fixed wing uh, drone survey as well. But each offers a very different approach to studying an archaeological site. And ideally, this is how aerial survey should work in its widest uh, sort of uh, scope within the toolkit. Uh, we have the observer-directed approach, rapid access, uh, often to remote sites, rapid identification of sites as well, and the ability to rapidly pass on information when it's seen. And here we have a, a coastal cliff colliery in Pembrokeshire at Trevain, the main photograph last year after a considerable coastal bracken burn there uh, on the national, uh, in the Co Pembrokeshire Coast National Park on the coast path there as well. So we photographed that as part of a two or three hour flight uh, the next morning we could send pictures to the National Park in Cadu. Uh, the central stack of the colliery is a listed building as well. And that photograph is currently being used in the new annual report for the National Trail Officer at the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park. Uh, but it provides limited detail. So last month we were fortunate enough to go back with a small team and carry out uh, drone-based photogrammetry of the coastal colliery before the vegetation grows back. So we have to contact the private landowner, deploy signage on the path, uh, and get a team out there to do GNSS control points to lock the survey down. But that's now on Sketchfab and gives us a fantastic high detailed uh, digital terrain model of the remains. And this is the sort of complete package, the complete deployment of the toolkit approach uh, which we've tried throughout the Cherish project. So air survey in a light aircraft or helicopter remains one of the best ways to rapidly respond to seasonal or weather conditions. As Anthony said, in a drought uh, like that in 2018, you may have two or three weeks to respond to crop marks appearing in the uh, coastal landscape. Here we've seen this site before, but this is quite a surprise. This is a, a, a Romana British style defended enclosure here at Marlos on National Trust land in Pembrokeshire. A large pit outside its entrance, remains of a roundhouse inside. This uh, peninsula was first overflown in 1949 by Cambridge University photographers, uh, St. Joseph, looking for archaeology. And here we have new archaeology revealed in 2018. We saw similar results in 2018 for the Bruna Boyne landscape, of course. Uh, so the ability to keep a rapid roving eye on the landscape, that turn of the fields, the turn of the crops, is one of the strongest ways to discover and record new archaeology before it disappears after a rainstorm. Within the Cherish Project 2, we've tried to uh, respond rapidly to extremes of tide and season, but also following uh, key storms, as Kieran mentioned. Uh, Storm Ophelia really battered the coasts of Wales and Ireland in 2017. Five days later, we were able to get out, when it had calmed down a bit, uh, to carry out uh, rapid photography of the Pembrokeshire landscape. Uh, with the clean-up operation happening at Newgale here, where the shingle bank had been bulldozed back across 
from the road, Aberedi Beach, with a massive erosion of the beach car park here, Portharao Coastal Promontory Fort as well. Just getting that snapshot in time, that legal record, those have formed part of our National Monuments Record Archive now for the following century or more uh, for people to come back and consult as well. Perhaps one of the most rewarding parts of the Cherish project, the bit I most look forward to, I think, back in 2015 in the planning stages, uh, was the ability to share our practice with flying uh, to colleagues in Ireland. Now, there's plenty of uh, aerial archaeology has happened over the years in Ireland as well, uh, but it's been good to get more flying done in the Cherish project. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that over three epochs of flying, you see there on the map, out of Cork, Western Airport and Kerry Airport, we've achieved 25 hours of collaborative aerial survey, uh, and more has been done then by our Discovery Program colleagues as well. Um, and this has been a really valuable uh, practice, you know, what the Iron and Wales funding is all about, uh, and working or building relationships with the local airports as well. What's their insurance regime? What aircraft availability do they have? Are the pilots used to flying for aerial archaeology? Uh, very good contacts made with the Atlantic Flight Training Academy down here, Barry Toomey, the pilot who flew us in 2017 for Waterford and Wexford, and again in 2022 for Kerry. Getting lovely shots of Steg Fort here last May, and it's Tight Valley as well. Uh, and hopefully there, there's a legacy of practice, of confidence to hire aircraft in the future and take them up over landscapes as time dictates. Another super rewarding part of the project in 2019 was the Air and Earth Conference. A day conference in the Botanic Gardens followed by a two-day parallel UAV and drone school and a flying school uh, for 13 delegates, including professional archaeologists and heritage practitioners as well. We brought across Damien Grady from English Heritage, Historic England, to share his good practice too. Uh, you know, looking at a ground school, photo settings, f-stops, exposure, composing the shot, but also passing on the message that really once you're in the air, all the money's been spent. You're there, the pilot's there, the weather's there, you've got the aircraft, so relax and compose some good shots. Don't come back to the, the airport with a lot of blurred imagery. You know, it's about sort of calming down and remembering why you're there and getting those perfect images. And we've had some really successful reconnaissance trips as well. There was a need to carry out new aerial reconnaissance over Dublin Bay and its offshore islands and properties and some of the baseline study sites. It's extremely difficult to do uh, with drones because of the, the controlled traffic region for Dublin International, a very busy landscape. Uh, so in 2019, everything came together uh, to work with Western Airport to get us in at 500 feet, working closely with air traffic for two hours of survey over Dublin Bay. And Rob Shaw and I were very lucky to see the stack of steam there, virtually no wind, very good water visibility, and low March light in conditions that may not be repeated for some time. Looking over the Aviva Stadium here as well, setting out to Howth. We were able to survey over a couple of hours south from Dorky Island, Dunleary, Howth, uh, Island's Eye, Dramana, uh, and Braymore uh, going north. Uh, around 600 air photographs taken because we may not get back out here again for some time, and even out to Rockerville Lighthouse and so on. So sub-meter resolution images, stereo pairs where we could, uh, getting good landscape photography for image impact, and then archaeological recording with inshore waters uh, around Shenix Isle here as well, and new shots of Dramana. So a really successful batch of images there, and these going through into the Irish archives, of course, by our Discovery Programme colleagues. We mustn't forget the power of an image, whether by drone or from an aircraft. Uh, this image of Rush has proved popular since being taken in 2019. It shows the vulnerability of the coastal properties here, the historic Martello Tower, the harbours, and the geology as well. So there is, alongside the hard job of recording, and documenting, and the legal record, that emotive power of these images to engage the audience and engage communities. And it was nice after COVID and other issues and stormy periods to finally get back down to Kerry last May uh, for some really valuable recording, eight hours of recording over two days in between two quite stormy periods of weather. Uh, Rob, Ted, myself, Hannah, uh, with Barry coming across and relocating an aircraft to Kerry Airport for two days of survey, getting out over the stunning landscapes recording some of our key baseline study sites, like this castle and promontory fort in the foreground here as well, 
uh, and trying to get as much work done while they have the opportunity uh, with the funding and the collaborative work in place. Revisiting some of our baseline study sites in the aircraft, Balanced Skellis Cast on the left, Ferritus Promontory Fort on the right with the excavated uh, roundhouse backfill that we'll hear about from Sandra later on. Um, these sites have been surveyed with drones, photogrammetry and so on, but getting back out there with the aircraft at 1,500, 2,000 feet and scanning wider over Balanced Skellis Bay for fish traps, submerged walls, wrecks. You know, it's that valuable interaction of all the techniques to thoroughly survey these monuments for posterity. And we see in this photograph already today of Skelligs. Uh, but getting out to the Skelligs is very good. Uh, an aircraft really is one of the best and most stable platforms to get out rapidly to offshore uh, reefs and islands. Uh, the pilots usually have to in fails. Rob and I were wearing life jackets and had been given a good briefing about ditching if it happened. Luckily, it didn't. Uh, but once all that's taken out of the equation, we can get 12 kilometers off in that weather window we have for a few hours. Ted luckily got back out there later in the week uh, to get some really important new survey to augment all that important drone uh, photography and imagery that we have uh, for these islands as well. So it's been a very positive experience. Uh, the aerial survey, just one of our many toolkit approaches, uh, but one which I hope that collaboration uh, between our nations uh, may well continue uh, in the future as well. So many thanks indeed, Jochen Val. Thanks very much, Toby. Some excellent timekeeping going on here. <laughs> I'm going to move uh, now to Jeff Duller uh, from Cherish and Aberystwyth University, uh, Scientific Dating and Chronology. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. What I'd like to do uh, is to talk a little bit about one of the other elements of the toolkit that we've heard about, um, and that is to do with uh, scientific dating and producing a chronology for the, some of the features, both archaeological and geomorphological, that we've uh, been studying as part of Cherish. One of the most important techniques, of course, for this is radiocarbon, and that's a technique that's been used widely through Cherish and that many people here will be familiar with. The method that I want to talk about, though, today is a different one. It's that of luminescence dating. Now, radiocarbon dating is wonderful, but, of course, you need to have some sort of organic material, something that's going to contain some carbon, in order to provide you with a chronology. And that is not always available. You might not always have wood or charcoal in your sample. So an alternative approach is to use luminescence dating. And luminescence studies the actual mineral grains that make up the sediment that often covers uh, archaeological sites uh, or that make, make up the geomorphological features that we're interested in. And it relies upon the principle that naturally occurring radiation, radioactivity <clears throat> that is in the environment all around us, uh, the building that we're in, cosmic rays from space, uh, soil uh, that, that uh, uh, is around us, all of these occur, have had low levels of naturally occurring radioactivity. And that radioactivity delivers energy. And a property of some very commonly occurring minerals, such as quartz and feldspar, is that they can store some of this energy within their crystal structure. And the longer they're exposed to that radioactivity, more energy uh, is accumulated. In the laboratory, we can bring these minerals back into the laboratory and we can make them release that energy. And when they release that energy, it comes out in the form of light. So we actually get light from these mineral grains. And essentially, the brighter that mineral, uh, that light, uh, the brighter, the older the sample. So what we have in the middle of image here is a picture of some quartz grains on, mounted on a disk. Uh, and in the image to the right there, what's happening is we're encouraging that release of energy. And you can see those grains starting to glow. And then they decrease again. And they decrease because we've emptied all the energy out. It's like a battery. Once you've discharged it, it's gone. So how can we use this for dating? Well, it turns out that these mineral grains also have a very, another useful property. A good analogy here for what these mineral grains are doing is to think of them as rechargeable batteries, a bit like the battery in your mobile phone. And one of the interesting properties of these mineral grains and this signal is that when we expose it to daylight, that releases the energy. So simply taking these mineral grains out into the daylight uh, for a few minutes is enough to completely flatten the battery. It releases all of the stored energy. 
So mineral grains that might be blowing around by wind activity or in the near shore, uh, by, by wave action or in fluvial systems, that exposure to daylight is enough to reset our signal. So if you like, it sets our clock to zero. When those grains are buried by further accumulation of sediments, of course, they're no longer exposed to daylight. They're shielded. But they are now exposed, again, to that radioactivity from the natural environment, from the mineral grains themselves and their surroundings. And so while they're buried, that energy builds up within those mineral grains. The longer they're buried, the more energy they absorb. We can then come along and collect those samples, bring them back to the laboratory, and measure the luminescent signal. And essentially, the brighter the, that luminescent signal that comes out, the brighter the light that we see, uh, the larger the radiation dose that they've been exposed to. And this gives us the basis for a clock, for a dating method. So the luminescence enables us to estimate how much radioactivity they've been exposed to while they were buried, since they last were exposed to daylight. If we then go in and make some additional measurements to measure how radioactive the sediment was, and that's a fairly standard method that we can apply, there's a number of different approaches there, then we can work out how much radioactivity they're exposed to each year, and if we divide one value by the other, we calculate the age. So this is our clock. This is the basis for luminescence dating that enables us to date the mineral grains and the last time they were exposed to daylight. So I'd like to show you a couple of examples of how we've used this as part of the Cherish Toolkit. And the first site that I want to go to is one that we've heard about already uh, a couple of times, and that's Dean Stinsley uh, on the northwest coast of Wales. And as we'll hear about later on today as well, of course, there's been a very important excavation occurring at this uh, hill fort um, as part of uh, the, the, under the Cherish project. Um, and that uh, um, exposed a very important uh, roundhouse uh, that's been the subject of a lot of investigation. The image on the left here um, shows the excavation pretty well uh, at the end. Uh, the one on the right shows uh, part of the uh, excavation while it was undergoing, and you can see on the, uh, the, the here part of the uh, uh, wall making up the, the roundhouse, uh, and these are the sediments that had previously buried uh, the whole site. Uh, my colleague, Professor Helen Roberts, uh, who runs the Luminescence Laboratory with me in uh, Aberystwyth, uh, along with Cherish colleagues, uh, went and collected a series of samples, you can see them here, uh, banged into the, the sediment here, uh, to date those with luminescence, to try to understand when this feature was built, uh, and when, indeed when it was abandoned as sand accumulated uh, over the top of this section. And these are the ages that we got, and you can see them both as uh, in thousands of years before present uh, and as common era, uh, dates common era. And you can see that at the very base of this section, uh, we get a, a, a date uh, of 110 common era, and that's presumably dating the uh, sediment on, upon which uh, this structure was built. There's then quite a significant hiatus between uh, that age uh, and the one immediately above it, uh, of almost a thousand years. So we get an age of 1100 common era here, and that's, we interpret, to do with the time while this site was occupied, uh, and the date of 1100 is presumably when sediment, when sand was starting to accumulate within the roundhouse itself. So it tells us that by then, presumably, it had been abandoned. And the ages above that then go up in uh, age um, 1320, 1460 common era, and 1790. And this records the continued accumulation of sand being blown up off the adjacent beach, uh, ultimately burying this site completely uh, until it was excavated. The instantly, of course, sits within a much wider environmental context. And we can see the hill fort at the bottom of this image uh, stretching away to the north. Uh, we have the wetlands, uh, Carnarvon Airport, and to the north, uh, the um, spit, the coastal spit of Morpha Dinsley, which is picked out very nicely in this LIDAR image um, uh, up, uh, up at the top here. And we were interested to try to understand the nature of that wider environment in which uh, people living at Dinsley uh, were, were, were living. So this next image is from uh, flying over the Menai Strait looking south, so in the foreground, uh, this is Morphodinsley, uh, the airport here at Carnarvon, 
uh, and then down to Dinners Dinsley at the south there. Now, previous work that had been undertaken by Charlie Bristow from Birkbeck College, um, uh, undertaken for, by C for CCW some years ago, had undertaken a ground penetrating radar survey across that and demonstrated there were a series of coastal um, uh, gravel ridges uh, that had accumulated. Uh, and on top of those gravel ridges, sand dunes had subsequently formed. Um, but what wasn't known was the chronology, where, how long that process of building out this substantial spit feature had taken, and whether it related to the period of occupation uh, of Dinas Dinsley or, or not. So as part of Cherish, we were able to go in and uh, take a series of samples along this transect. This is the transect that Charlie had done for uh, the GPR. Um, and as part of uh, Cherish, we were able to go in uh, and collect 12 samples along there of the sediments associated with those gravel ridges. And you can see here the ages, each of these uh, dots represents the age of one of these gravel ridges, uh, and the age is on this axis, so this is zero common era up to the present day, and this is going from the southeast to the northwest, and you can see that this feature started to form around 100, 200 common era, actually very similar to the time period when Dinas Dinsley, uh, that roundhouse was built. Uh, and these ridges have built up subsequently over the last 2,000 years. And in fact, there's quite an interesting but quite complex story there about erosion uh, as well as deposition. So I hope what this has shown you has given you a flavor for the way in which luminescence can be used as a very powerful geochronological tool where um, uh, material for radiocarbon is not suitable or in parallel with radiocarbon. A number of these sites we've used both techniques together uh, very efficiently. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Jeff, and <clears throat> thanks to all our speakers. Um, Leslie, our, we're just going to do a combination of questions from Slido and um, from the floor. So is, is there already a question from Slido? Uh, yes, we have a question from I'm not sure if we can hear you there, um, Leslie. Yeah. So can everyone hear now? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Great. we have a question from Hannah Fluck. Of all the approaches developed and included in the toolkit, which do you think will be the most useful for the future of coastal heritage management? Anthony, you <laughs> just start anyway. I think for ourselves, the UAVs at the start of the projects were just kind of coming, or, the, or let's say the, just every day off the shelf UAVs were coming available to us. And that kind of opened up a whole new possibility of or access to remote sensing and things like this. So and it's got a lot easier to do. And it's, I know there's a lot more regulation over the past year with the European regulations, but it's a, it's a way that people can you know, get, gather high quality data and, and just that perspective on the monuments they're trying to uh, look at. And I think like even most archeologists now should think of a drone as a camera that they can take on site and just go and inspect, even let's say masonry up high and things like this that allows you to gain access. Absolutely, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's phenomenal in our work in the National Monument Service in terms of monitoring change, you know, so yeah. definitely. Any other? Just to say, I mean, you know, looking at one technique that would be most useful going forward, I think the one thing from the toolkit approach is the, the collaboration between yeah. archeologists and geographers that's been most exciting and most useful over the last six or seven years for myself particularly, and ourselves, uh, you know, working with geologists, geographers and archaeologists on site, you, you have such a bigger dimension of understanding of that eroding site than you would have just with four or five archaeologists on their own. So I think that's an interdisciplinary aspect of the toolkit approach is, is invaluable. It's got to continue. Absolutely. So the interdisciplinary really is the only way. And I think, I think you know, in terms of what we're learning about climate change, it's, it's definitely uh, the approach that we have to take. Um, is, are there... A, Questions from the floor? Um, I can't, it's amazing, you can't, I can't really see anybody. <laughs> um, I know there's a roving mic, I see a few hands. Yeah, so we might just alternate between Slido and um, the floor if that's okay. Thanks for your question, Hannah. Okay, Gunnar excellent presentations. Was there a conscious decision to ignore the estuarine landscapes? Like the low energy, you seem to pick sites that are sort of dramatic, iconic. Um, and, and those big estuarine, Cork Harbour, Blackwater, you know, where you have huge areas of unmapped intertidal zone, 
mud flats. So it seemed an obvious project to look at, given that there's Stranford Lock project and the Shan Estuary work. So I'm just curious as sure. to the decision initially. There was two restrictions. One, the funding region. We had to work between the, the Shannon uh, and the Boyne, and we couldn't work out outside of that. But there was areas, say, around Wexford, say, Clon Mines, these kind of areas where we did work in those estuary conditions. But I suppose whenever we were prioritising sites, and we were looking at the kind of what were the major hazards and impacts on a lot of these sites, and erosion we were finding was the, the, the main driver in site selection. Toby, you want to come in there? Yeah, it was also very early in the planning stages looking at areas that were data poor. Um, particularly from Wales, the low-lying floodable areas had been very well flown with high-resolution LIDAR for flood risk monitoring. And it was the headlands and the islands and the rural coastlines which had very little data better than the 19th century Ordnance Survey mapping. And so that's why we tended to put a lot of our effort into improving data quality and data accuracy in those more difficult to reach parts of the landscape. But as Anthony said, we also, well, Jeff showed the, uh, the Menai Strait and, and the estuarine landscape there that's, that's benefited from a huge amount of new research as well. Thank you. Will we take another question from Slido, Leslie? Uh, yes, uh, the next question is from Nicola Sharman and she asks what platform or method has Cherish used to enable members of the community to record data? Yep. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Um, we were very lucky to, to work with an, a number of collaborators and somewhere in the room here um, where we were able to develop an app that we were able to, to trial out with members of, of the community. And it was to, to try and get people um, involved, to try and get people to start looking at, at their landscape. So we were able to get volunteers from the Copper Coast Geopark to, to go out and record sections of, of a road and coastline where using the geolocation on, on their phone, they're able to take photos of that area to then start being able to build a picture of the change that, that's happening there. And again, to, to complement the, um, the techniques that what we've been able to apply, that, that can range from the vessels might get there anywhere between you know, one and three times over the course of, of the project. The UAVs, you might be able to go certain several times a year if, if you are. This was able to get people on a, a much shorter time getting out in the fields to, to start recognised change in, in the area, and so we have found that useful. And in terms of private owners, landowners, what was the experience there in terms of groups, you, you know, was there in terms of communicating and the understanding of climate change threats? Yeah, no, and, it, and it's a very good point that, that you raised, is the permission aspect of it and the insurance. So we took an approach where we went to public areas uh, only, so it was public beaches is where we went to. We also, to, to trial it, uh, we used groups that had existing insurance um, as well that we were able to piggyback on, on the back of that. So we didn't have that issue of access. Um, so, so we didn't... We didn't it, because it can be quite... It, yeah. Um, any further uh, questions from the floor? Um, if there aren't, if I don't see anything at the moment. Is, are there another question on Slido? Great, Leslie, thanks. Uh, yes, we have quite a few questions oh, on okay. Slido, actually. Uh, <laughs> but I'll okay. go with the one that has the uh, most votes. Uh, so the next one is from Oscar James. How do you collect samples for luminescence data? Is it similar to sediment or ice cores, but on a more localized level? Yeah, very good question. One of the challenges, of course, with, with the luminescence is we're dating the last exposure to daylight. So the one thing we mustn't do is expose the sample to daylight while we're, we're collecting it. So the, the, the sim very straightforward way to do that in terms of if it's a, 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 a relatively um, open sediment, a sort of a, a sand or something, is to, is to clean up a section and hammer a tube in, a plastic tube, uh, block both ends. And, and the key is to, is to collect a sample uh, in, a, in a good archaeological context so you can get that relationship between the archaeology and the sediment that you're dating uh, and make sure in that plastic tube that it's protected from daylight uh, while you collect it and, and carry it back to the laboratory. Thanks very much, Jeff. Is another question there, Leslie? Uh, yes, and the next one is also for Jeff. So a bit of a pragmatic question for Jeff, sorry. How expensive is luminescence dating? Is it significantly more costly than radiocarbon? And that is from Neil Jackman. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, yes, it is more expensive. 
um, uh, it, it's sort of typical sorts of costs are, are sort of the order of four or five hundred pounds per sample. So it is significantly more expensive, unfortunately, than radiocarbon. Partly because there are, there are many more measurements. We're actually measuring more parameters in radiocarbon. You're essentially only measuring the concentration of C14, of that one isotope. Unfortunately, we have to, to make quite a few more measurements uh, and of more parameters. So unfortunately, it's a little more expensive. But come and talk to a luminescence laboratory. You never know what they might say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, another, yeah, we can c take another couple of questions, yeah. Okay, the next question is from Naomi. Um, how have you found engaging large industries such as fisheries, um, offshore renewable developments alongside local communities on culturally important uh, but resource valuable sites? Who wants to? Yeah, I, I, I can start on that for, for a few of them. Um, because of the, from the marine side, uh, I mean, the, the bits that, that we were involved in, because of the, the coastal nature of it, we were actually away from a, a lot of the, the other stakeholders. So we, we weren't in areas of offshore renewable energy. We, we weren't in um, prime fishing air, areas as well. So fr from that element, um, we, we didn't have any, any issues and, and there was sort of no need for any major con consultation. We've always encountered, when we're in areas from members of the public, um, I think, Everyone has an interest in archaeology and everyone has a, a, an interest in the landscape ar around them. And certainly, like, you know, the, the excavations aside, most of the techniques that we're applying are, are non-invasive uh, as well. So there's actually very little change to, to the area. And so certainly we've always had a, a very positive response from any of the, the interactions that we have had from stakeholders. And there hasn't been any issue with, with it. And they've always seen that the value of it and the value for understanding. And people are always very keen to feed in their own knowledge and understanding of the area to the project. I suppose like Toby said when he was organising the flights in Dublin, it's about building up that expertise and knowing who to ask for permissions and yeah. those kind of things which will stay with us as an organisation moving forward beyond the project. And I think the stunning images, Toby, that we saw there, um, the Promontory Fort at Dramana, you know, aerial images like that really have a resonance with the public and they can see both the beauty and, and the heritage, but also the threats that are imposed and how vulnerable sites are. So they're, they're very stunning images. Um, a further question, Leslie, thanks. Um, I have uh, two questions which are uh, similar from Oscar James and Siobhan, uh, both asking if the um, data that uh, was collected through Cherish is publicly available and Siobhan is specifically asking about the aerial photographs and the LiDAR data. Yeah, so for Ireland, uh, I suppose all four partners will be making the data available through different portals. So we'll be depositing all our data with the Digital Repository of Ireland, and then that'll be openly accessible, uh, free for anybody to use as, as they choose. And there'll be a metadata associated with that also. And then I know for, say, Toby and uh, the guys in the GSI, they will all have different portals that allow people to get access to all this data. So everything we've collected will be available. And that's kind of the power of what we do. We, these are some of these baseline surveys will be valuable in 10, 20 years' time. So when people Absolutely. can start making comparisons, when the surveys get carried out again, to identify those areas of loss and, and also accretion. And we talked about the lasting impact. So it's, it's, it's the surveys, but it's also the toolkit. So I expect there will be a lot of interest in, in going back again and again to the material to learn from it. Um, so in terms of the toolkit, will that appear on all individual sites or is the Jerish website will continue or where will the toolkit be housed in that way or, well, or available in that way? The Cherish website. Well, like I suppose it's, it's published now and well, the published actual published book will go on the, our, each of our repositories as well as a, as a publication. So it's Fantastic. A, be free so. for, to use as well. I just say, I mean, that's one thing we've built in, I think, uh, from very early on in the pl planning of the project is to avoid the cliff edge of the end of the project. And that's why we get, yeah, we've got these four partners with big data legacies in each of our archives. And whether it's an archive of cold stored uh, peak cores at Aberystwyth University or you know, on the uh, Royal Commission database, you can just search for Cherish Project, it brings up thousands of records and the air photographs are free to use under license. So yeah, and we, I think we thought early on with how do we avoid yeah. that drop off and how do we build that legacy in early. Yeah, yeah and I know John O'Keefe will be talking about legacy later. Um, so, once again, to thank all our speakers, um, it was a very interesting session, um, thank you very much. Um, we have some um, 
time now to announce Leslie, our Slido winner of our uh, competition at our Cherish uh, Prizes. <laughs> Yes, congratulations to Beth Ann Thomas, who answered uh, the fastest and correctly within eight seconds. <laughs> what <did you> say? <laughs> I've got the bag, so press that. Oh, you don't. There's still two more shots, isn't <laughs> Uh, so it remains for me uh, just to remind everybody about the Cherish exhibition in the Poddle Room back here, also the stands outside and in terms of the National Monument Service and the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, uh, there's a stand for our un underwater section and uh, climate change sectoral adaptation plan and actually Laura has reminded me that copies of our plan which were published in, in 2019 um, are available uh, to take away there um, out in, in the lobby there. Um, so we're going to break for coffee until half past 11 and we're asking for people to return at 11.30. So it remains for to acknowledge our speakers and thank you very, very much. <laughs>